Section 22 of Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen by Albert Hubbard. Chapter 12, Part 1, James J. Hill. The armed fleets of an enemy approaching our harbors would be no more alarming than the relentless advance of a day when we shall have neither sufficient food nor the means to purchase it for our population. The farmers of a nation must save it in the future, just as they built its greatness in the past. James J. Hill James Jerome Hill has one credential, at least, to greatness. He was born in a log house. But let the painful fact be stated at once, without apology, that he could never be President of the United States because this historic log house was situated in Canada. The exact spot is about three miles from the village of Rockwood, Wellington County, Ontario. Rockwood is seven miles east of Guelph, 40 from Toronto, and 100 from Buffalo. Mr. Hill well remembers his first visit to Toronto. He went with his father, with a load of farm produce. It took two days to go and two to return, and for their load, they got the princely sum of $7 with which they counted themselves rich. James Hill, the father of James Jerome Hill, was a North of Ireland man. His wife was Anne Dunbar, good and Scotch. I saw a portrait of Anne Dunbar Hill in Mr. Hill's residence at St. Paul, and was also shown the daguerreotype from which it was painted. It shows a woman of decided personality, strong in feature, frank, fearless, honest, sane, and poised. The dress reveals the columnar neck that goes only with a superb bodily vigor. The nose is large, the chin firm, the mouth strong. She looks like a Spartan, save for the pensive eyes that gaze upon a world from which she has passed, hungry and wistful. The woman certainly had ambition and aspiration which were unsatisfied. James J. Hill is the son of his mother. His form, features, mental characteristics, and ambition are the endowment of mother to son. It was a tough old farm, then as now. As I trampled across its undulating acres a week ago and saw the stone fences and the piles of glacial drift that Jim Hill's hands helped pick up, I thought of the poverty of the situation when no railroad passed that way, and wheat was twenty cents a bushel and pork one cent a pound, all for the lack of a market. Jim Hill, as a boy, fought the battle of life with axe, hoe, maul, adze, shovel, pick, mattock, draw shave, rake, and pitchfork. Wool was carded and spun and woven by hand. The grist was carried to the mill on horseback, or if the roads were bad, on the farmer's back. All this pioneer experience came to James J. Hill as a necessary part of his education. Life in Canada West in the 40s was essentially the same as life in western New York at the same period. The country was a forest traversed with swamps and sinkholes on which roads were built by laying down long logs and across these small logs. This formed the classic corduroy road. When ten years of age, James Hill contracted to build a mile of corduroy road between his father's farm and the village. For this labor, his father promised him a two-year-old colt. The boy built the road all right. It took him six months, but the grades were easy and the curves so-so. The Tom Sawyer plan came in handy. Otherwise, it is probable there would have been a default on the time limit. And Jim got the colt. He rode the animal for half a year, back and forth all winter from the farm to the village, where he attended the famous Rockwood Academy. Then, someone to whom the Elder Hill was indebted signified a desire for the colt, and the father turned the horse over to the creditor. When little Jim went out and found that the stall was empty, he had a good cry, all by himself. Three years after this, when his father died, he cried again, and that was the last time he ever wept over any of his own troubles. From his seventh to his fourteenth year, young Jim Hill attended the Rockford Academy. This academy had about thirty boarding boys and a dozen day scholars. Jim Hill was a day scholar, and the pride of the master. The boy was studious, appreciative, grateful. He wasn't so awfully clever, but he was true. The master of the academy was Professor William Weatherald, stern to view, but very gentle of heart. His wife was of the family of Balls. 
The Ball family moved from Virginia two generations before to western New York, and then, when the Revolutionary War was on, slid over to Ontario for political reasons best known to themselves. There was quite an emigration to Canada about then, including those worthy Mohawk Indians whose descendants, including Longboat the Runner and Princess Veroka, are now to be found in the neighborhood of Brantford. And certainly the Indians were wise, for Canada has treated the Red Brother with a degree of fairness quite unknown on this side of the line. As for the Tories, but what's the need of arguing? The Balls traced to the same family that produced Mary Ball, and Mary Ball was the mother of George Washington. So, ta so tangled is this web of pedigree, and George Washington, be it known, got his genius from his mother, not from the tribe of Washington. William Weatherall died at an advanced age, near 90, I believe, only a short time ago. It is customary for a teacher to prophecy, after the pupil has arrived, and declared, What did I tell you? Weatherall looked after young Hill at school with almost a father's affection, and prophesied for him great things. Only the great things were to be in the realms of science, oratory, and literature. Along about 1888, when James J. Hill was getting his feet well planted on the earth, he sent for his old teacher to come to St. Paul. Weatherall spent several weeks there, riding over the hill roads in a private car and discussing old times with the owner of the car and the railroad. Mr. Hill insisted that Weatherall should remain and teach the Hill children, but fate said otherwise. There is no doubt that Hill's love of books, art, natural history, and his habit of independent thought were largely fixed in his nature through the influence of this fine friend, teacher of children. The Quaker listens for the voice and then acts without hunting up precedents. In other words, he does the things he wants to do. Mr. Hill's long hair and full beard form a sort of unconscious tribute to Weatherall. In fact, let James J. Hill wear a dusty Miller suit and a wide-brimmed hat, and you get the true type of Hicksite. James J. Hill is a score of men in one, as every great man is. But when the kindly, philosophic, paternal, and altruistic Yim Hill is in the saddle, you will see the significance of his, this story. Just after Mr. Hill had gotten possession of the Burlington, he made a trip over the road. The rear-end flagman at Galesburg was boasting to some of his mates about how he had gone over the decision with the new boss of the ranch. Here, a listener puts in a question thus. What kind of looking fellow is the old man? And he of the red lantern and torpedo scratches his head and explains, Well, you see, it's like this. He looks like Jesus Christ, only he's heavier set. The father of James J. Hill was a worthy man with a good hold on simple virtues, a weak chin, and a cosmos of slaty gray. His only claim to immortality lies in the fact that he was the father of his son. Pneumonia took him, as it often does the physically strong, and he passed out before he had reached his prime. Death is the most joyfulest thing in life, said Thomas Carlyle to Milburn, the blind preacher, when it transfers responsibility to those big enough to shoulder it, for that's the only way you can make a man. I once saw a boy of fourteen on the prairies of Kansas transformed into a man between the rising of the sun and its setting. His father was crushed beneath a wagon that sluiced him and toppled in it crossing a gully. The hub caught the poor man square in the chest, and after we got him out he never spoke. Six children and the mother were left, the oldest boy being fourteen. A grave was dug there on the prairie the next day, and this boy of fourteen patted down the earth over his father's grave with the back of a spade. He then hitched up the horses, rounded up the cattle, and headed to the cavalcade for the west. He was a man, and in afterlife he proved himself one. On the death of his father, Jim Hill's school days were done. His aptitude in mathematics, his ability to keep accounts, and his general disposition to make himself useful secured him a place in the village store, which was also the post office. His pay was one dollar a week. This training in the country store proved of great value, just as it did in the case of H. H. Rogers, George Peabody, and so many other men of mark. It is one thing to get a job and another to hold it. Jim Hill held his job, and his salary was raised before the end of the first year to three dollars a week. On the strength of this prosperity, the struggle on the old farm with its stumps, boulders, and mortgage was given up, and the widow moved her little brood to town. 
The log house on the rambling main street of the village is now pointed out to visitors. Here, the mother sewed for neighbors, took in washing, made garden, and with the help of her boy Jim, grew happy and fairly prosperous, more prosperous than the family had ever been. Thus matters went on until Jim was in his eighteenth year, when the wanderlust got hold of the young man. His mother saw it coming, and being wise, did not apply the brake. Man is a migrating animal. To sit still and stay in one place is to vegetate. Jim, with twenty dollars in his pocket, started for Toronto on foot with a bundle on a stick, followed by the prayers of his mother, the gaping wonder of the children, and the blessing of Professor Wetherall. Toronto was interesting, but too near home to think of as a permanent stopping place. A leaky little streamer ran over to Fort Niagara every other day. Jim took passage, reached the foreign shore, walked up Niagara Falls, and the next day tramped on to Buffalo. This was in the wonderful year of the 1856, the year the Republican Party was born at Bloomington, Illinois. It was a time of unrest, of a healthy discontent and goodly prosperity, for things were in motion. The docks at Buffalo were all a bustle with emigrants going west, forever west. Jim Hill, aged 18, strong, healthy, farmer boy, lumberman, clerk, shipped as roustabout on a schooner bound for Chicago. His pay for the round trip was to be $10 and board. The money was payable when the boat got back to Buffalo. If he left the ship at Chicago, he was to get no cash. The boat reached Chicago in 10 days. It was a great trip, full of mild adventure and lots of things that would have surprised the folks at Rockford. Jim got a job on the docks as a checker off or understudy to a freight clerk. The pay was a dollar a day. He now sent his original twenty dollars back to his mother to prove to her that he was prosperous, and money was but a bagatelle and a burden. A month, and he had joined the ever-moving westward tide. He was headed for California, the land of shining nuggets and rainbow hopes. He reached Rock Island and saw a sign out at the sawmill. Men wanted. He knew the business and was given work on site. In a week, his mathematics came in handy, and he was handed a lumber rule and a blank book. Mr. Hill yet recalls his first sight of a Mississippi River steamboat coming into Davenport. The tall smokestacks belching fire, the graceful swan-like motion, the marvelous beauty of the superstructure, the wonderful letter D in gold, or something that looked like gold, swung between the stacks. It was just dusk, and as the boat glided in toward the shore, a big torch was set ablaze. The gangplank was run out to the weird song of the colored deckhands, and Miracle and Fairyland arrived. For a month, whenever a steamboat blew its siren whistle, Jim was on the wharf, open-mouthed, gaping, wondering, admiring. One day, he could stand it no longer. He threw off his job and took passage on the sailing palace, Molly Devine, for Dubuque. Here he changed boats and boarded a smaller vessel, a stern wheeler, deck passage for St. Paul, a point which seemed to the young man somewhere near the North Pole. He was going to get his fill of steamboat riding for once at least. It was his intention to remain at St. Paul a couple of days, see St. Anthony's Falls and Minnehaha, and then take the same boat back down the river. But something happened that induced him to change his plans. The two days on the steamboat had wearied Jim. The prenatal Scotch idea of industry was upon him, and conscience had begun to squirm. He applied for work as soon as he walked out on the levee. The place was the office of the steamboat company. He stated in an offhand way that he had experience on the waterfront in Chicago, Rock Island, and Davenport. He was hired on the spot as shipping clerk with the gratuitous remark, If you haven't sense enough to figure, you are surely strong enough to hustle. The agents of the steamboat line were J.W. Bass and Company. Hill got along all right. He was a day clerk or night clerk, just as the boats came in. And it is wonderful how steamboats on the Mississippi usually arrive at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Jim slept on a cot in the office, so as to be on hand when a boat arrived and to help unload. 
It was the duty of the shipping clerk to check off the freight as it was brought ashore. Also, it was the law of steamboating that clerks took their meals on board the boat if they were helping to unload her. Now, as Jim had food and a place to sleep when a Dubuque and St. Paul steamboat was tied at the levee, all the meals he had to buy were those when no steamboat was in sight. Being essentially scotch, Jim managed to time his meals so as to last over, and sometimes if a boat was stuck on a sandbar, he did the McFadden Act for a whole day. It became a sort of joke in the office, and we hear of Mr. Bass, the agent, shouting up to the pilot house of a steamboat, Avast there, sir, for five minutes until Jim Hill stows his hold. A part of Jim's work was to get wood for fuel for the boats. This was quite a business in itself. He once got a big lot of fuel and proudly piled it on the levee, mountain high, in anticipation of several steamboats. A freshet came one night. The river rose and carried off every stick, so that when the Mary Ann arrived, there was no fuel. Wait until Jim Hill eats his breakfast and perhaps he'll get an armful of wood for us, shouted down the captain in derision. After that, Jim managed to load up a flat boat or two and always had a little wood in reserve. The young man was now fairly launched in business. The mystery of manifesting, billing, collecting, the matter of shorts, overs, and figuring damages were to him familiar. The territory of Minnesota was organized in 1849 and did not become a state until 1858. In 1857, there was not a single mile of railway in the territory, but in that year, Congress authorized the territory to give alternate sections of public lands to any company that would build a railway through them. Through this stimulus, in the latter part of 1857, there was organized a company with the ambitious title of the Minnesota and Pacific Railroad Company. Its line extended from the steamboat wharf in St. Paul to the falls of St. Anthony. There were 10 miles of track, including sidings, one engine, two boxcars, and a dozen flat cars for logs. The railroad didn't seem to thrive. There was no paying passenger traffic to speak of. Passengers got aboard all right, but on being pressed for fares, they felt insulted and jumped off, just as you would now if you got a ride with a farmer and he asked you to pay. Possibly, a rudimentary disinclination to pay fare still remains in most of us, like the hereditary indisposition of the Irish to pay rent. No one ever thought it possible that a railroad could compete with a steamboat, and it was a long time after this that Commodore Vanderbilt had the temerity to build a railroad along the banks of the Hudson and be called a lunatic. So there being no passenger traffic, the farmers carrying their grist to mill and the logs being floated down the river to the mills, the railroad was in a bad way. Something had to be done, so the Minnesota and Pacific was reorganized and a new road, the St. Paul and Pacific, brought it out with all its land grants. The intent of the new road was to strike right up into the woods for 10 or 20 miles above Minneapolis and bring down logs that otherwise would have to be hauled to the river. For a time, this road paid, with the sale of the odd-numbered sections of land that went with it. In 1867, James J. Hill became the St. Paul agent of this railroad. He had to quit his job with J.W. Bass to become agent for the Northwestern Packet Line. And as the railroad ran right into his door, he found it easy to serve both the steamboat company and the railroad. You will often hear people tell how James J. Hill began his railroad career as a station agent, but it must be remembered that he was a station agent plus. The agents of steamboat lines in those days were usually merchants or men who were financially responsible, and James J. Hill became the St. Paul agent of the St. Paul and Pacific because he was a man of resource with ability to get business for the railroad. As the extraordinary part of Mr. Hill's career did not begin until he was 40 years of age, our romantic friends who write of him often picture him as a failure up to that time. The fact is, he was making head and gathering gear right along. These 22 years up to the time that Mr. Hill became a railroad owner were years of intense activity.
While yet a clerk for J.W. Bass and Company, Mr. Hill made the acquaintance of Norman Kitson, as picturesque a figure as ever, wore a coonskin cap, and evolved from this to all the refinements of Piccadilly, only to discard these and return to the simple life. Kitson had been connected with the Hudson Bay Company. When Hill met him, he was running a fast express to Fort Garry, now Winnipeg, going over the route with ox carts. In summer, it took one month to go and the same to return. In winter, dog sleds were used and the trip was made more quickly. Kitson was the inventor and patentee of the Red River ox cart. It was a vehicle made of wood, save for the linchpins. The wheels were enormous, some being 10 feet in diameter. It was Kitson's theory that if you could make your wheel high enough, it would eliminate friction and run of its own momentum. The wheels were made by boring and pinning plank on plank, crisscross, and then chalking off with a string from the center. Then you sawed out your wheel, and there you were. The creaking of a train of these ox carts could be heard five miles. Kitson had the government contract for carrying the mails, and managed, with the help of trading in furs and loading up with merchandise on his own account, to make considerable money. When Hill was in his twenties, he went over the route with Kitson, and made several trips, also alone with dog sleds, for his friend when there was a rush of freight. On one such occasion, he had one companion, a half-breed of uncertain character, but who was taken along as a guide, he being familiar with the route. It was midwinter, the snow was heavy and deep, and there were no roads, and much of the way led over frozen lakes and along streams. To face the blizzards of that country alone, at that time, required the courage of seasoned pioneer. Hill didn't much like the looks of his companion. After a week out, when the fellow suggested their heading for Lake Superior and dividing their cargo, Hill became alarmed. The man was persistent and inclined to be quarrelsome. Each man had a knife and a rifle. Hill waited until they reached a high ridge. The snow lay dazzling white as far as the eye could reach. The nearest habitation was 50 miles away. Under pretense of fixing the harness on his dogs, Jim got about 40 feet from this man, quickly cocked his rifle, and got a bead on the half bead before the fellow knew what was up. At the word of command, the rogue dropped his rifle and held up his hands. The next order was to write about face. March! The order was obeyed. A double quick was ordered, and the half-breed lit out, quickening his pace as he got out of range. Hill then picked up the other rifle, put whip to his dogs, and by night had gone so far that he could not be overtaken. When Jim came back that way a few weeks later, he kept his eye peeled for danger but he never saw his friend again. When I heard Mr. Hill relate this story, he told it as simply as he might relate how he went out to milk the cows. One of the men present asked, Didn't you feel sorry for the fellow to turn him adrift on that frozen plain without food or fuel? Mr. Hill hesitated and then slowly answered, I thought of that, but preferred to send him adrift rather than kill him or let him kill me. Anyway, he had only some 50 miles to travel to strike an Indian village. When he was there, we were 150 miles apart. You see, I am a mathematician. It is a great joy to figure out what a long distance you are from some folks. End of section 22「Section 23 of Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eamon Ma. Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen by Albert Hubbard. Section 23. James J. Hill. Part 2. In his business of supplying cordwood to steamboats, Mr. Hill had a partner, grizzled and gray, by the name of Griggs, Griggs was a typical pioneer. He was always moving on. He bought a little sternwheel steamboat and shipped its boiler and engine across to Breckenridge, where he had the joy of running the first steamboat, the Northwest, on the Red River. 
Mr. Hill built the second steamboat on the Red River, the Swallow, on the order of Kitson, who bought the boat as soon as she had shown her ability to run. All the metal used in its making, which of course included engine and boiler, was sent across from St. Paul, and if the outfit was gotten out of a wrecked Mississippi sternwheeler, what boots it? Then it was that Kitson, having also bought the Griggs steamboat, was given the title of Commodore, a distinction which he carried through life. By this time several things had happened. One was that Hill had brought up to St. Paul a steamboat load of coal. This coal was mined near Peoria, on the Illinois River, floated down to Mississippi, then carried up to St. Paul. To bring coal to this new castle of wood was regarded as deliberate folly. By this time the St. Paul and Pacific had gotten a track laid clear through to Breckenridge, so as to connect with Commodore Kitson's steamboats. When Hill first reached St. Paul, there was no agriculture north of that point. The wheat belt still lingered around northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. The fact that seeds can be acclimated, like men and animals, was still in the ether. The Red River Valley is a wonderfully rich district. Louis Agassiz first mapped it and wrote a most interesting essay on it. Here was a wonderful prehistoric lake, draining to the south through the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, and thence to the Gulf of Mexico. By a volcanic rise of the land on the southern end, centuries ago the current was turned and ran north, making what we call the Red River, emptying into Lake Winnipeg, which in turn has an outlet into Hudson Bay. Agassiz came up the Mississippi River on a trip in 1865. The boat he traveled on was one for which James J. Hill was agent. Naturally, it devolved on Hill to show the visitors the sights thereabouts, and among these sights happened to be our friend Kitson, who, full of enthusiasm, offered to pilot the party across to the Red River. They accepted and ascended to Fort Garry. Agassiz, full of scientific enthusiasm, wrote out his theory about the prehistoric lake, and science, now the world over, calls the Red River Valley Lake Agassiz. With Louis Agassiz was his son Alexander, a fine young man with a pedagogic bent, headed for his father's place as curator of the museum at Harvard. From Winnipeg the party was supplied an Indian guide, who took them across to Lake Superior. Then it was that Alexander Agassiz saw the wonders of Lake Superior copper, and Lake Superior Iron. And Harvard lost a professor, but the world gained a multimillionaire. Louis Agassiz had no time to make money, but his son Alexander was not thus handicapped. The report of Agassiz on the mineral wealth of Lake Superior corroborated Mr. Hill's own opinions of this country, which he had traversed with dog sleds. Money was scarce, but he, even then, made a small investment in Lake Superior mineral lands, and has been increasing it practically ever since. A recent present to the stockholders of the Great Northern, of an iron tract worth many millions of dollars, had its germ in that memorable day when James J. Hill met the Agassiz party on the levee in St. Paul, and unconsciously changed their route as planned. Mr. Hill's experience would seem to prove that life after all is a sequence, and the man who does great work has long been in training for it. There are two ways for a traveling man to make money. One is to sell the goods, and the other is to work the expense account. There are two ways to make money by managing a railroad. One is through service to the people along the line of the road. The other is through working the bondholders. It was the eventful year of 1876, before James J. Hill really got up steam. He was then 38 years old. He was agent for the St. Paul and Pacific, and in this capacity he had seen that the road was being run with the idea of making money by milking the bondholders. The line had been pushed just as long as the bondholders of Holland would put up the money. To keep things going, interest had been paid to the worthy Dutch out of the money they had supplied. Gradually, the phlegmatic ones grew wise, and the purse strings of the Netherlands were drawn tight. For hundreds of years, Holland had sought a quick northwest passage to India, Little did she know she was now warm on the trail. Little, also, did Jim Hill know. The equipment, engines and cars, was borrowed, so when the receiver was appointed he found only the classic streak of rust and right-of-way. No doubt both of these would have been hypothecated if it were possible. Mr. Hill knew the Northwest as no other man did, 
except, possibly, Norman Kitson. He had traversed the country from St. Paul to Winnipeg on foot, by ox carts, on horseback, by dog sledges. He had seen it in all seasons and under all conditions. He knew the Red River Valley would raise wheat, and he knew that the prosperity of old Louis Agassiz meant the prosperity of the railroad that ran between that rich valley and St. Anthony's Falls, where the great flouring mills were situated, the center of the flower zone having been shifted from Rochester, New York, to Minneapolis, Minnesota. To gain possession of the railroad and run it so as to build up the country, and thus prosper as the farmers prospered, was his ambition. He was a farmer by prenatal tendency and by education, a commission man by chance, and a master of transportation by instinct. Every farmer should be interested in good roads, for his problem is quite as much to get his products to market as to raise them. Jim Hill focused on getting farm products to market. While he was a Canadian by birth, he had now become a citizen of the United States. His old friend, Commodore Kitson, was a Canadian by birth, and never got beyond taking out his first papers. The Winnipeg agent of the Hudson Bay Company was Donald Alexander Smith, a hearty Scotch burr of a man with many strong and sturdy oatmeal virtues. He had gone with the Hudson Bay Company as a laborer, became a guide, a trader, and then an agent. Hill and Kitson laid before Smith a plan, very plain, very simple. Buy up the bonds of the St. Paul and Pacific from the Dutch bondholders, foreclose, and own the railroad. Now, Donald A. Smith's connection with the Hudson Bay Company gave him a standing in Montreal banking circles, and to be trusted by Montreal is to have the ear of London. Donald A. Smith went down to Montreal and laid the plan before George Stephan, manager of the Bank of Montreal. If the Bank of Montreal endorsed a financial scheme, it was a go. Only one thing seemed to lie in the way, the willingness of the bondholders to sell out at a figure which our four Canadians could pay. Mr. Hill was for going to Holland and interviewing the bondholders personally. Stephan, more astute in big finance, said, bring them over here. Hill could not fetch them. Kitson couldn't, and Donald A. Smith couldn't, because there was no dog sled line to Amsterdam. The Bank of Montreal did the trick, and a committee of Dutchmen arrived to look over their Minnesota holdings with a view of selling out. Mr. Hill took them over the line, a dreary waste of slashings, then a wide expanse of prairie broken now and again by scrub oak and hazel groves, deep gullies here and there, swamps, sloughs, and ponds, with assets of brand, wild geese, ducks, and sandhill cranes. The road was in bad shape, the equipment worse. An inventory of the actual property was taken with the help of the Dutch committee. The visiting Hollanders made a report to the bondholders, advising sale of the bonds at an average of about 40% of their face value, which is what the inventory showed. Our Canadian friends secured an option which gave them time to turn. Farley, the receiver, was willing. The road was reorganized as the St. Paul, Minneapolis and Manitoba Railroad. George Stephan was president, Norman Kitson, first vice president, Donald A. Smith, second vice president, and James J. Hill, general manager. And on Mr. Hill fell the burden of turning a losing property into a prosperous and paying one. From the very day that he became manager, he breathed into the business the breath of life. He sent over to England and bought hundreds of young Hereford bulls and distributed them along the line of the road among the farmers. Jim Hill's bulls are pointed out now over 3,000 miles of range and jokes on how Hill bowled the market are always in order. Clydesdale horses were sent out on low prices and long time payments. Farm seeds, implements and lumber were put within the reach of any man who really wanted to get on and lo, the land prospered. The waste places were made green, and the desert blossomed like the rose. The financial blizzard of the year 1873 was, without doubt, an important factor in letting down the bars, so that James J. Hill could come to the front. The river valley at that time was not shipping a bushel of wheat. The settlers were just taking care of their own wants, and were feeding the Lady of the Snows up north around Winnipeg, we now know that the snows of the Lady of the Snows are mostly mythical, 
She is supplying her own food, and we are looking toward her with envious eyes. In the year 1909, the two Dakotas and Minnesotas produced more than 200 million bushels of wheat, worth, say, a dollar a bushel. And when wheat is a dollar a bushel, the farmers are buying pianolas. The Jim Hill country east of the Rockies is producing easily more than $500 million a year in food products that are sent to the east for market. The first time I saw Mr. Hill was in 1880. He was surely a dynamo of nervous energy. His full beard was tinged with gray, his hair was worn long, and he looked like a successful ranchman with an Omar Khayyam bias. That he hasn't painted pictures like Sir William Van Horn and thus put that worthy to shame is to me a marvel. Hill has been an educator of men. He even supplied Donald A. Smith a few business thrills. Tomorrow night I intend to entertain the governor, once said Smith to Hill. Tomorrow night you will be on the way to Europe to borrow money for me, said Hill. And it was so. First and foremost, James J. Hill is a farmer. He thinks of himself as following a plough, milking cows, salting steers, shoveling out ear corn for the pigs. He can lift his voice and call the cattle from a mile away, and does at times. He bought a section of Red River Railroad land from himself and put it in his wife's name. The land was swampy, covered with swale, and the settlers had all passed it up as worthless. Mr. Hill cut the swale, tiled the land, and grew a crop that put the farmers to shame. He then started a tile factory in the vicinity and sold it to the managers, two young fellows from the east, as soon as they proved that they had the mental phosphorus and the commercial jamaki. The agricultural schools have always interested Mr. Hill. That which brings a practical return and makes men self-supporting and self-reliant is his eternal hobby. Four years in college is to him too much. You can get what you want in a year, or not at all, he says. He has sent hundreds of farmers' boys to the agriculture colleges for short terms. Imagine what this means to boys who have been born on the farm and have never been off it. To get the stimulus of travel, lectures, books, and new sights and scenes. In this work, often the boys did not know who their benefactor was. The money was supplied by some man in the nearby town. That was all. These boys, inoculated at Mr. Hill's expense with the education microbe, have often been a civilizing leaven in new communities in the Dakotas, Montana, and Washington. In 1888, the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba became a part of the Great Northern. Hill had reached out beyond the wheat country into the arid zone, which was found to be not nearly so arid as we thought. The Black Angus and the white-faced Herefords followed, and where once were only scattering droves of skinny pintos, now were to be seen shaggy-legged shire horses and dappled percherons. The bicycle had come, and also the trolley car, and Calamity Jake prophesied that horses would soon be valuable only for feeding Frenchmen. But Jacob was wrong. Good horses steadily increased in value, and today, in spite of automobiles and airplanes, the prices of horses have aviated. Jim Hill's railroads last year hauled over 300,000 horses out of Montana to the eastern states. The clothes that a man wears, the house that he builds for his family, and the furnishings that he places therein are all an index of his character. Mr. Hill's mansion on Summit Avenue, St. Paul, was built to last a thousand years. The bronze girder that supports the staircase is strong enough to hold up a locomotive. The house is nearly 200 feet long, but looks proportionate, from the art gallery, with its fine pictures and pipe organ at one end, to its rich leather-finished dining room at the other. It is of brownstone, the real Fifth Avenue stuff. Fond du Lac stone is cheaper and perhaps just as good, but it has the objectionable light-colored spots. Nothing but the best will do for Hill. The tallest flagpole that can pass the curves of the mountains between Peugeot Sound and St. Paul graces the yard. The kitchen is lined with glazed brick, so that a hose could be turned on the walls. The laundry room has immense drawers for indoor drying of clothes, no need to open a single window for ventilation, as air from above is forced inside over ice chambers in summer and over hot water pipes in winter. Mr. Hill is a rare judge of art and has the best collection of Barbizons in America. 
Anyone can get from his private secretary, J. J. Toomey, a card of admission. As early as 1881, Mr. Hill had in his modest home on Ninth Street, St. Paul, several carros. Mr. Hill is fond of good horses, and has a hundred or so of them on his farm of three thousand acres, ten miles north of St. Paul. Some years ago, while president of the Great Northern Railway, he drove night and morning in summertime, to and from his farm to his office. He very often walks to his house on Summit Avenue, or takes a street car. He is thoroughly democratic, and may be seen almost any day walking from the Great Northern Railway office, engaged in conversation with one or more, and no matter how deeply engrossed or how important the subject in hand, he never fails to greet with a nod or a smile an acquaintance. He knows everybody and sees everything. Mr. Hill knows more about farming than any other man I ever met. He raises hogs and cattle, has taken prizes for fat cattle at the Chicago show, and knows more than anybody else today as to the food supply of the world. Yes, and of the coal and timber supply, too. He has formed public opinion on these matters, and others, by his able contributions to various magazines. Seattle has erected a monument to James J. Hill, and St. Paul and Minneapolis will, I know, ere long be only too glad to do something in the same line, only greater. Just how any man will act under excitement is an unknown quantity. When the Omaha Railway General Offices in St. Paul took fire, at the first alarm, E.W. Winter, then general manager, ran for the stairway, emerging on the street. Then he bawled up to his clerk on the second floor excitedly, Charlie, bring down my hat. But his clerk, young Fuller, with more presence of mind, was then at the telephone sending in word to the fire department. Everybody got out safely, but the building was destroyed. One night about ten o'clock, the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway offices at St. Paul caught fire. The smoke penetrated the room where Mr. Hill, with his secretary, Will Steffens, was doing some work after all others had departed. They had paid no attention to the alarm of fire, but the smell of smoke started them into action. Young Steffens hurriedly carried valued books and papers to the vault, while Mr. Hill, with the strength of a giant, grasped a heavy roll-top desk used by A. H. Boat, controller, pushed it to the wall, and threw it bodily out of the second-story window. The desk was shattered to fragments, and the hoodlums grabbed on to the contents. No harm was done to the railway office, save discoloring the edges of some documents. The next morning, when Bode, all unconscious of fire or accident, came to work, Edward Sawyer, the treasurer, said jokingly, Bode, you may consider yourself discharged, for your desk is in the street. When Conductor McMillan sold his farm in the valley for $10,000, he asked Mr. Hill what he should do with the money. Buy Northern Securities, was the answer. He did so and saw them jump one-third. Frank Moffat was Mr. Hill's secretary for some years. Frank now has charge of the PV estate. C.D. Bentley, now a prominent insurance man of St. Paul, a friend of Frank's, used to visit him in Mr. Hill's private office. Mr. Hill caught him there once and said, Young man, if I catch you here again, I'll throw you out of the window. Bentley thought he meant it, so he kept away in the future. He told the story once in my presence, when Mr. Hill was also present. Mr. Hill bought red lemonade for the bunch. A porter on his private car was foolish enough to ask him at Chicago once, at what hour the train returned. That porter had all day to look for another job, and Mr. Hill's secretary provided another porter at once. Mr. Hill cannot overlook incompetency or neglect. Colonel Clough engineered Northern Securities. M.D. Grover, attorney for the Great Northern Railway, said it would not work. Grover was the brightest attorney the road ever had. When the scheme failed, Grover never once said, I told you so. And Mr. Hill sent him a check for $1,000, over and above his salary. Colonel Clough was employed at a salary of $15,000, some years before his real work began. He came from the Northern Pacific. Mr. Hill, when asked by a leading official of that road what he thought of the colonel, replied, Huh, he's a good man to file contracts. Mr. Hill said of Alan Manville, then general manager of his road, He may make a man some day. Mr. Hill grew faster than any man about him. He distanced them all. S.S. Breed was treasurer of the old St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. His signature in a bold, fine hand adorned all the bonds of that road, held mostly by the Dutch. He was made auditor when the St. Paul, 
Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railway was formed. Breed had reached his point of greatest efficiency, but that did not suffice Mr. Hill, who said to him more than once, for Breed was an old-timer and well-liked, If you can't do the work, I'll have to get someone who can. Mr. Hill, however, neither fired the old man nor reduced his pay. Breed got work up to his death in the Great Northern Railway Office, but at the last he served as a guide for strangers. Breed was supplanted by Bode as controller, followed by C.H. Warren, and then by Farrington, and all three big boys. About 1889, Mr. Hill gave an address at a banquet in the Merchant's Hotel, St. Paul. With a large map of the United States and Canada on the wall, he took a huge pair of dividers, or compasses, and putting one leg of the dividers on the map at St. Paul, he swung the other leg out, southeast, 1,500 miles as the crow flies, into the ocean off the Carolina coast. Then with St. Paul still as a center, he swung the compasses around to the northwest, 1,500 miles. All this country, he said, is within the wheat belt, the leg of the compasses went beyond Edmonton and Alberta. Last year, this new Canadian country produced more than 100 million bushels of wheat, and this is only the beginning. Mr. Hill has always maintained that to call cotton king is a misnomer. Cotton never was king. Wheat is king, for food is more important than raiment. Wheat is the natural food of man. The civilization of ancient Greece was built upon the Nile Valley wheat. It is the one complete, perfect, vegetable food. It contains all the elements necessary to the making of the human body. The supply of wheat is the arterial blood that makes this world of ours do something. Without wheat, we would languish, go quickly to seed as China has. St. Paul and Minneapolis lie at the head of navigation on the Mississippi River, a little less than 2,000 miles by water from the Gulf, and about the same distance from Puget Sound tidewater by rail. These cities are in the middle of the wheat belt. To this point came Mr. Hill, a green country youth. Transportation was his theme, and transportation of wheat has been the foundation of his success. Wheat is of more importance to us than anything else, than gold or cotton or coal or timber or iron. Mr. Hill carries all these over his railroads. The Great Northern Railway, the Northern Pacific, and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Over 20,000 miles of track are in the hollow of his hand. He directs, controls, even to minute details, this great transportation system. His 75th birthday was celebrated a year ago last September. Still, he fails not. He has given up the presidency of the Great Northern Railway, retaining, however, the title Chairman of the Board. But we all know that his hand is felt just the same in every part of the working of these miles of track. Rare ripes rot, but the man who comes into his own late in life has a sense of values and trains on. Mr. Hill does not ask for taffy on a stick, and while he prizes friendship, the hate or praise of those for whose opinions he has little respect are to him as naught. No one need burn the social incense before him in a warm desire to reach his Wolitowski. He judges quickly, and his decisions are usually right and just. It isn't time yet to write his biography. Too many men are alive who have been moved, pushed, and gently jostled out of the way by him, as he forged to the front. Perspective is required in order to get rid of prejudice, but the work of James J. Hill is dedicated to time, and Cleo will eventually write his name high on her roster as a great modern prophet, a creator, a builder. Pericles built the city, but this man made an empire. Smiling farms, thriving schools, busy factories and happy homes sprang into being in the sunlight of prosperity which he made possible, and as yet the wealth of the hill country is practically untapped. So here endeth Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen, being volume 11 of the series, as written by Albert Hubbard, edited and arranged by Fred Bann, borders and initials by Roycroft Artists, and produced by the Roycrofters, at their shops, which are in East Aurora, Erie County, New York, 1922. End of section 23. End of Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Businessmen by Albert Hubbard.